Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who curses you I will curse, and by you all of the families of the earth shall bless themselves. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God, we pray that you would speak your words to us this morning. May the words of my mouth and the meditations on all of our hearts be acceptable unto you. For you, O oh God, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I heard a story the other day about a Methodist who occasionally liked to sneak off to the horse races. But he wasn't very good, and uh, one day he'd all but lost his shirt when suddenly he noticed a priest step out onto the track and he blessed the forehead of one of the horses lining up for the fourth race of the day. And lo and behold, that horse, a very long shot, won the race. So the next race, as the horses lined up, the priest stepped onto the track again, and sure enough, he blessed one of those horses, and that guy won. So our guy made a beeline for a betting window and placed a small bet on that horse. And again, even though it was another long shot, the horse won the race. So he collected his winnings and anxiously waited to see which horse the priest would bless next. He bet big on it, and he won again. As the races continued, the priest kept blessing long shots, and each one ended up winning, and our guy was just elated. So for the last race, he made a quick dash to the ATM, withdrew all of his savings, and waited for the priest's blessing that would tell him which horse to bet on. True to his pattern, the priest stepped out onto the track for the last race and blessed the forehead of an old, old horse that was the longest shot of the day. This time, the priest blessed the eyes and ears and hooves of the old horse. Sure that he had a winner, our guy goes and bets every cent he owned on the old horse. He watched dumbfounded as the horse came in very last. In a state of shock, he goes to the track area where the priest was standing and confronting him. He demands, Father, what happened? All day long, you blessed horses and they won. And then in the last race, the horse you blessed lost by a mile. And now, thanks to you, I've lost every cent of my savings. The priest nodded very wisely and with sympathy said to him, Son, that's the problem with you Protestants. You can't tell the difference between a simple blessing and last rites. <laughs> We're in the fourth week of our sermon series, Lessons from the Toy Chest, and over the last four weeks, we've been reminded of lessons we learn as we play, and we've been reminded of biblical truths represented by these toys, so that you will never look at these toys in the same way again. We've played with Play-Doh and been reminded that God can and does mold us both as individuals and as a community of faith. We played with Mr. Potato Head and remembered that we are called to be the body of Christ, that each part is needed, and that we have to be plugged into Christ for those parts and gifts to be at their very best. We played with Paint by Water books and remembered our baptism, and this week we come to a toy that is both toy and treat, Pez dispensers. Pez candy was originally invented as a breath mint in Vienna, Austria in 1927. The word Pez comes uh, from the German word for peppermint, and it takes the first, middle, and last letter of the word that I'm not even going to try to pronounce for you to form the word Pez. In 1948, a man named Oskar Uxa designed the first Pez dispenser, which was called a box regular. It resembled um, cigarette lighters, and they didn't have the little toy thing on top, and it didn't have a foot. It looked like a cigarette lighter, and it was used as a way to encourage people to stop smoking. In the mid-1950s, the character dispensers were begin to be, uh, began to be made and fruity flavors made to market them more towards children. So Santa, a robot, and a space gun were the first of these new types of dispensers. And the rest, they say, is history. They started making more and more characters. It gained popularity and began to be sold all over the world. They began making sets of them that you could collect, like Star Wars, or um, there's a set of uh, almost all of the presidents. Disney princesses, Lord of the Rings, Hello Kitty. There are now over 550 unique dispenser heads with thousands of variations. So you might find one character in three different colors. Pez collecting as a hobby has become so popular that there are now several conventions held each year about Pez dispensers. <laughs> And I didn't know this, but eBay was originally created by Pez collectors as a way of selling and trading Pez with other collectors. Isn't that crazy? I think it's crazy. 
The most valuable Pez dispensers currently are three political donkeys that are valued at $13,000 a piece, one of which was originally owned by JFK. $13,000 for a Pez dispenser. Blows my mind. So what can we learn from Pez? We should have started collecting them a long, long time ago, <laughs> is what we learned. You should have kept the ones you had as a child and not taken them out of their package. No, that's not today's lesson. As we learned in our children's sermon from Steve, the fun of Pez is that you get to share it. You could just eat them all yourself, but the fun of the toy is that you get to put the candy into this figurine and then move its head each time you offer someone else candy. They aren't just for you, they're to share. You can use your Pez to bless someone else. Have you ever noticed that we use that word blessing a lot? We use it uh, to talk about saying a prayer before a meal, say the blessing. We use it as a way of telling people goodbye, God bless you as you leave. In my hometown in Southern Maryland, there's a big brick sign as you're leaving my county to go into the next, and it's dedicated to one of the county's native sons, uh, Louis Goldstein, who was a longtime comptroller of Maryland. He was uh, born not far from my hometown. And it reads, God bless y'all real good. I'm not, it's a big brick. People think I'm joking when I tell you it says that, but it really says that, because he used to say that all the time in the end of his speeches when he would go places. If you help someone, often uh, the response is a God bless you, or sometimes, especially in the South, when you're asked how are you, people will respond with I'm blessed. We use it a lot, and in a lot of different ways to mean a lot of different things. It is what the Lord says to Abram in our scripture passage today. I will make you a blessing, I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. We also see it at other times in scripture. In the creation story, God creates the great sea creatures, the fish, and then the birds, and blesses them all. Later in the book of uh, Genesis, Jacob and Esau have a bitter fight over their father's blessing, and Jacob ends up stealing it from his older brother on his father's deathbed. In the book of Ruth, Naomi calls for the Lord to bless Boaz. The psalmist uses it a lot. Blessed are those who walk in the light of the Lord. Blessed are those who seek God's justice. And Jesus uses it on the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are those who weep. Blessed are those who are hungry. Blessed are those who are persecuted for my name's sake. So what exactly does the word blessing mean? And what is it that the Lord means when he tells Abram, I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing? Well, the word blessing means bestowing, literally bestowing or receiving God's favor. When used to reference us blessing God, it means to praise or salute God. So when Jesus says, blessed are those who weep, what he's really saying is that God's favor rests on those who weep. The saying that Jesus said on that day on the Sermon of the Mount was a radical reversal of standards, but that's a sermon for a different day. When the psalmist says, all your work shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you, what the psalmist is really saying is that all the saints will praise and worship God together. In this passage from Genesis, God is the one blessing Abram. So that means God is saying God will bestow favor on Abram and help him prosper so that Abram can help others receive God's favor as well. God's plan is to lavish blessings or favor on Abram and his family, but God doesn't intend to love Abram's family more than any other family. Instead, Abram's family is going to be blessed, loved, and favored so that others can know God's blessing as well, God's favor and God's love. In fact, he says the whole world will come to receive God's love and favor through the actions of Abram and his family. God says to him, go where I send you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. Because we use blessing in so many different contexts, we usually think of a blessing as something to be said, not something to be enacted and embodied. But God tells Abram, be a blessing. Literally, the Hebrew says, so be you a blessing. Be you God's favor. Abram isn't commanded to pray using some kind of liturgical formula, but rather is told that he has to embody blessing in his very being. He is to live his life in such a way that he is to be a means of God bestowing favor on others. If you think about it too hard, it's a, a kind of a weird paradox. God chooses this one particular person, this one particular family, but through that relationship, every last family on earth must benefit. So God is particular, but also universal. Again, don't think about it too hard, it will make your head hurt. 
I have a friend named Scott who has a Pez collection. He now has approximately 1,500 Pez on display in his house. Barry, can you pop the picture up? This is a picture of his um, den, and I think there's one more. That's this other side. And then he, uh, he gave me a, a picture of the old ones. These are um, the first characters that were developed. They, Pez didn't have feet on them originally, like the ones um, Steve was holding a minute ago. So he has 1,500 Pez. Now, that doesn't count the duplicates that, um, or extras that they have in the basement waiting to be traded with other Pez heads, as they are known in the collecting world. But after years of uh, watching his dad collect Pez, my amazing godson Peter has started his own little collection as well. I think he has like 25 or something. Now, unlike his father, Peter takes great joy in playing with the dispensers and putting candy in them. One of Peter's favorite things to do is to put candy in his Pez dispenser and then hand them out to people. But when he goes out around handing out candy, he never asks if you want a piece of candy. Instead, Peter proudly walks up to you and says, would you like a love? Isn't that cute? If you say yes, then he proudly produces a candy out of his Pez dispenser and hands it to you. And how could you say no when a little kid comes up asking if you want love? When Peter offers love to anyone who will take them, there is no strings attached. It's not contingent on anything else. You say yes, and he gives you the candy. It's the same way with God's blessing in this passage. There are no if clauses in the statement God makes. It is not if you are a blessing to other people, then I will bless you and make your name great. No, God's very love for Israel and God's love for all of humanity is shown here. And it's uh, not just love for a reason, because we've done something. It's love for no reason at all. Love freely offered with no strings attached, the very best kind. And even more than that, it's not love that is just a feeling. It's love with a purpose. Love not for a reason, but love with a purpose. This relationship between God and Abram and now between God and us has a purpose that the whole world might be blessed through it, that the whole world will know God's love, God's favor through us. God loves Abram and God loves the world, and so God sends Abram on a journey that will bless the world. God loves us and God loves the world, and so God sends us into the world to bless the world. Abram and all of us become like Pez dispensers, conduits of God's grace. Did you know that Pez come in different packages? You can get um, Pez in plastic wrap that has just two of the little candy packages with it. Or the most common a way that sold, Pez is sold is with the cardboard back on it. And if you get it like that, there's uh, three packs of Pez candy in it. Or there's Pez in the hol uh, holiday tubes that comes with five packs of candy. Or... You can buy this. <laughs> it's really creepy, isn't it? It's really creepy. Uh, he only had three of these, so this was my choice. Uh, so if you buy a jumbo one like this, it dispenses full packs of candy, and it comes with 12 packs of candy. We're just going to put him right here so you can stare at all of you while I finish. So, the idea is the more Pez you get, the more you have to share, right? But Pez doesn't come with any kind of if clause, just like God's love. When you buy it at the store, the cashier doesn't ask you if you're going to promise to share it. However, you don't get the fun if you don't share, right? Can you imagine pulling this out and asking somebody if they wanted love in the form of a Pez thing? You can sit alone in your room and eat all of the packages of candy that will come with this thing, or you can share that candy with your friends and laugh and giggle over the characters and the fun. God's love is the same. God will love you whether you share it or not, but it becomes so much more when we share it with the world around us, when we love our neighbors, when we try to bless, bless others with no expectation of getting something in return, when we let our faith inform the way we, we react to events in the world around us, when we use God's love to fuel us into action for feeding the hungry and clothing the naked and setting the oppressed free, the world becomes a better place and God's desires for us are fulfilled. When we realize that God blesses us, favors us, loves us, not just for our sake but for the sake of others, we begin to experience the fullness of God's love. 
It's one of those paradoxical things where the more you give, the more you have. The more you share your blessings, the more you are blessed. The more you share loves, the more love you experience yourself. The more you share joy, the more joy you experience yourself. Friends, may you realize that you are intended to be a dispenser, a means of God's love and grace to all the world, so that all might know and the world might be changed. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As we continue